why i strongly disagree with rahul gandhi in his stand on the prana pratishta of ram temple in ayodhya vanakkam welcome namaskaram jai hind when it comes to anything pertaining to religion rahul gandhi seems to be very naive and uh, i would therefore advise him to forbear the comments he wants to make or the stand he feels simple to take regarding anything religious i would say anything regarding religious about any religion whatsoever because religion is quite a different cup of tea from what Rahul Gandhi and most people assume it to be the fact that we practice religion does not mean that we understand it Rahul Gandhi seems to be on fairly sound grounds as far as understanding the spirituality of the Hindu tradition is concerned from the speech he made in the parliament that point is fairly simple when he was absolutely clear and wholesomely assertive that a hindu cannot tell lies or repose faith in falsehood a hindu cannot uh, practice terrorism or violence a hindu cannot revel in spreading a culture of hate so on and so forth he emphasized the catholicity uh, and the hospitality of the hindu mind and which is absolutely true i don't think anyone can disagree with him but when he feels uh, indignant that the pran pradishta ceremony of the landmark ram temple in ayodhya <coughs> one of the most significant achievements of the narendra modi government has been turned regrettably into a nach gana event that's exactly what he said and i'm quoting his words as they were uttered by him <clears throat> a nach gana event a dance and song episode now it's a very very um visual picturesque and serious comment to make normally everyone assumes the pran pratishta of a temple to be perhaps the most solemn function imaginable perhaps more solemn than the republic day or the independence day <coughs> or the or gandhi jayanti celebrations or whatever so for such an event to be termed or described as a nach gana event is a serious matter and what was his basis for making this charge or this criticism the charge was that the event was uh, showcased with the presence of the glitterati especially from <clears throat> the bollywood uh, people like amitabh bachchan and others um now from a strictly puritanical spiritual point of view the projection of the social glitterati not the intellectual glitterati but social glitterati could be considered something of an anomaly but from the religious point of view that's the only thing that matters and this is something that i would sincerely advise rahul gandhi to understand this is not true about hinduism is true about every religion in the world because all religions are man made they may claim an antecedent history in terms of some kind of supernatural revelation uh, etc but religion as it is organized into a system governed by customs traditions religious codes canons etc are 100% man made and every man made system is addicted to glamour 
glamour. Now you think of um, you think of a sports event. For example, Olympics. The recently concluded Paris Olympics, Olympics 2024. Do you think the inauguration of the Olympics could showcase the most honest people in the world, the most intellectually acclaimed of the world, the Nobel laureates to be paraded, or some most popular uh, artists, singers, dancers, etc.? What do you think would be appreciated? Suppose um, the French organizers of the 2024 Olympics had chosen to make the inaugural event of the Olympics a historic uh, occasion by parading all the Nobel laureates living uh, as the piece de resistance, the uh, ultimate uh, uh, point of distinction of this uh, inaugural ceremony. They would have been laughed at. On the other hand, if the most attractive actresses in the world, the most successful actors in the world are brought together and paraded, everybody will applaud. So Rahul Gandhi needs to understand that wherever religion comes into play, the first priority will not be God but glamour. God will lose the battle, the competition, before even the competition can begin, to the glamorous of the world. I know this about uh, my community, the Christian community. If a significant event of some public um, visibility is thought of, the most important consideration is not the spiritual relevance of that event, or how to preserve and project the spiritual universal nature of the event, but how to make the event more and more impressive. And there are only two ways by which a religious event can be made impressive. One is through the genuineness and the profundity of its spiritual content. But when there is no spiritual con uh, um, content, when there is no spiritual uh, significance, how is this event to be made into something big, something to be talked about, something that satisfy the, satisfies the people? There's only one way left, and that is by showcasing glamour. Now, when a spiritual event is authentic, not only that there is, an, there is no need to showcase glamour, but that it will be felt by everyone concerned that showcasing, gla showcasing glamour is an insult to the spiritual majesty of the event. But if the spiritual uh, side of the event is empty, then the event will flop. If the best the most um, exalted, outlandish, the at most imaginable in glamour is not showcased. Um, now, what Rahul Gandhi needs to know is that the addiction to and wide-eyed admiration for the glamour of the glory of the world is central to the very idea of religion. It's not a new development. It's been there from the very beginning. For example, why does Jesus in his teachings try to emphasize the importance of recognizing the spiritual merit of the poor? Jesus said, blessed are the poor. By that, Jesus did not mean that poverty per se is a blessing. Unfortunately, this is how the teaching of Jesus Christ is preached about in a very mistaken manner. 
the very purpose of this teaching is to effect a corrective to the inherent spiritual poverty in every religious tradition, particularly the tradition or the way of life that he envisaged, which will be otherwise characterized by this thirst for glamour. The poor or developing a healthy respect for the poor or the freedom to recognize the human relevance of the poor shows a very high degree of commitment to spiritual truth. And it's the only antidote to the spiritual bankruptcy which drives people to rely almost entirely on the glitterati of a society. Every society has its own share, its own ration of the glitterati. The Jewish society had its own share of the glitterati, social, religious, political, etc. And religion as it was practiced then, suffered from the same problem, though to a lesser extent. As cultures advance and become more and more elaborate, as materialism begins to rape the inner soul of a religious tradition, what happens is that the spiritual light is substituted with or substituted by cultural glamour. And therefore, more and more tendency to showcase the rich, the powerful and the glamorous. They, they all form part of the same thing, the elite. The elite in beauty, the elite in political power, the elite in economic power. They all become one with the elite in, the, in religious power. So you will find the religious elite trying to cultivate on the one hand, the political elite, then the social elite, then the economic elite, then the cultural elite where actors, singers, you know, people who are very popular, the cultural icons of the times, they all come. So they all belong together. And for priests who actually belong to this group, if you read that very interesting book titled Theory of the Leisure Class by Thornstein Weblen, I made a reference to this book in one of my earlier videos, probably about uh, five, six months ago, uh, where Weblen, V-B-L-E-N, Weblen, V-B-L-E-N, Weblen. Weblen points out that in every society, in every nation, the priestly class belongs to the elite. Even if by intellectual attainment or cultural refinement they do not belong there, they do everything possible to make sure that they have a niche for themselves within the space of the elite. So you will find the religious elite trying to cultivate the political elite in particular, and that's very obvious in the Kerala context. It's also true in the Indian context in general, as it is true of the global context. For example, there is no distinction between the religious right and the political right in the United States of America. And Donald Trump is the bridge between the two. And therefore, Donald Trump will have the blind support of the religious right in America. I'm not saying that the religious uh, authorities should uh, support the Democrats. I have no such pro uh, advocacy. I don't belong to any party. <clears throat> So, because this is a problem inherent in religion, Jesus goes to the other extent of romanticizing the poor without romanticizing poverty. That's the important thing to remember. Jesus does not romanticize or legitimize or justify poverty. In fact, he wants poverty to be um, eliminated without creating spiritual poverty. So what happens is, when poverty ceases to exist and all emerge from poverty, then another sort of poverty begins and that's the poverty of inner life. And that's why Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, is within you, which is a state of inner wealth. So Jesus sees a relationship of inverse proportion between material wealth, which is acquired, and the inner wealth, which is spiritual, which is, uh, uh, which is earned or um, uh, developed by the individual through 
uh, strategies, practices, disciplines, um, quite contrary to what succeeds in the markets of the world. So, the more the more the inner wealth declines, the more the thirst for external show of begins to exercise complete ascendancy over us. Uh, the Metropolitan of the Marthoma Church, to take just one example, the former Metropolitan of the Marthoma Church, uh, Irenaeus Thirimeni, Bishop Irenaeus Marthoma, when his 90th birthday was celebrated, the highest point of the celebration, the highest achievement, the watershed moment was the Prime Minister saying a few words, felicitating the Metropolitan of the Marthoma Church and all the Marthomites anywhere in the world nearly died with their chest swelling with pride. That's the degree to which religion fosters and promotes this thirst for glamour. Or to take another example, a bishop of the Orthodox Church, the Bishop of Kundangulam, in the presence of hundreds of the people assembled, made a very, very public statement with unrivaled fervor that for 17 long years he was dreaming to be closer physically close to a Tamil actress. And that great dream was fulfilled when a particular hospital inauguration was to take place, the lady came. Now think of the, you know, uh, that inauguration without the cine artist. It's a flop. It's a thorough flop. So I can give you instances after instances after instances. You can't think of religion without the thirst for glamour. Why? Because the principle is the same. The more bankrupt you are within yourself, the more enamoured you become of outward show, pomp and splendour. If a Christian church is to celebrate, suppose there is a church in Kerala which is 100 years old, if it is to celebrate its centenary, it will not be satisfied with getting anything less than either the President or Prime Minister of India. If the President of America can be got, well and good. If not, at least the President of India. Not that the President of America is more religious than your next door neighbour. So, Coming back to this issue, Rahul Gandhi must realize that his idea of religion is somewhat naive. Religion is not about truth, religion is not about love, religion is not about godliness, religion is not about fellow feeling. Religion is a theater where acting takes place. Nobody is free to be authentic, sincere, true, true to himself, true to his neighbor, True to God, everyone has to act according to certain patterns, modes, fix for it. In religion, you play act. You're acting the role of a Hindu and what it means to be a Hindu will not be decided by you. It will be decided by the priestly class. He would say, if you do these and these and these and these rituals, then you are a Hindu. No one will say that uh, Hinduism, in Hinduism, God is truth. And therefore, a Hindu is one who stands steadfastly by truth. No one will tell you that. Whereas if you perform these rituals, no one will tell you that God is omnipresent. And therefore, the presence of God need not be sought inside a temple. After all, the word temple in Hindi means mandar. Mandar means inside your mind. Man ka andar, mandar. In that case, why make such a hoo-ha about a big temple? 
I don't know about uh, Hindus making temples. I certainly know this about uh, Christians. Building more and more churches and bigger and bigger temples is not a sign of spiritual progress. It is a sign of spiritual regression. It is a sign of the ascendancy of materialism over Christianity. It is a sign that Christians are getting progressively alienated from the very source of their spirituality, which is Jesus Christ, whose great, uh, shall I say, claim was that the foxes have their holes, the birds in the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That was his strength. Why didn't he need these great temples, these great palaces, these great facilities, this great show off? Because he was authentic. He said, I am the light, I am the truth. Now, such a personality, if you and I develop such a personality, we would have no need to show off. Why is it that in all religious traditions, the priestly class have their uniforms? Some uniforms are simple as in the case of Hindu sannyasis. I envy Hindu sannyasins, sannyasis, because their attire, religious attire is so simple. When I compare the theatre costume of my bishops, Thirumanis, etc., I feel sorry for them. How, how do they endure this sartorial oppression? But think of meeting a bishop without his regalia. You will be thoroughly, thoroughly disappointed. You would recognize him to be spiritually inferior to your servant in, in many cases, if not in all cases. For such people, it's very important that a certain air of religiosity is spread around, broadcast, sh sh showed, up, showed off, flaunted. So when you come to anything religious, absolutely anything religious, you must realize that it's not truth that matters. It is the show off. Religion is from start to finish a show biz. Now, do you really believe, rationally speaking, that the dedication of a church, I'm not talking about dedication of the Ram Temple and this Pran Pradeshta because then I might be accused of being biased against a religion. I leave the inference system to my viewers because my viewers are intelligent. Suppose a grand Christian church is built at the, uh, at the expense of 3,000 crores. Everywhere people are talking about it. Oh, what a church. Do you think the quality, the spiritual merit of the worship that will happen week after week thereafter after the inauguration, will be even marginally influenced by who dedicates that church. And yet if it's a big church, a gloriously built church, it is an unwritten rule that the highest religious authority must come and dedicate it. What's the connection between his coming, dedicating the church, to the life of worship that is meant to happen in the church week after week, month after month, year after month? Absolutely nothing. And yet, if that inaugural event is not made as glamorous as it can be, as satisfying to the eye and the ear as can be, then people would be sorely disappointed. Absolutely disappointed. You will see this thirst for glamour in every aspect of life. Whatever is worldly, is punctuated, is characterized by this thirst for glamour. Because what is worldly has absolutely no means to discern the inner truth. If you factor the inner truth into the equation, then you will be immediately delivered of this obsession with outward show, pomp and splendor. And you will recognize that to be some form of worldly obscenity in relation to the spiritual light of the event or situation envisaged. So I have to say again, Rahul Gandhi is 100% wrong. Uh, I thoroughly 
uh, understand and fully appreciate showcasing the glitterati at this event because no religious event of any magnitude it doesn't matter which religion would be considered satisfactory unless this important ingredient which takes the place of the presence of God right at the beginning I said that when it comes to religion it is not God that matters it is the glitterati that matter so the absence of the glitterati from a religious event of great magnitude will be felt a worse situation, a worse lacuna than the complete absence of God himself. At any rate, I don't think God is impressed by any of these things. And there is something seriously wrong with God. So, uh, I have to say once again, apologies to Rahul, but Mr. Rahul, you are very naive when it comes to understanding religion. You are absolutely right as regards the spirituality of Hinduism is concerned, which is also light. God is truth. Now, if God is truth, what is the role and relevance of the glitterati? There you are absolutely right. But your fundamental fatal flaw, your total great mistake lies in equating temples and all the paraphernalia, paraphernalia, priestly paraphernalia associated with it, rituals, traditions, customs, practices, etc., with God. God has nothing to do with any of these things. That is why an, a human being has to do the pra pran pradishta. He has to actually infuse his pran, his spirit into it. So these are all very broad, clear patterns. And uh, for such an event to happen, all these things that are traditionally put together in the form of a highly successful, relig successful religious ceremony, are necessary and I can congratulate the organizers of this grand event of the inauguration of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya for doing an outstanding piece of work and I thoroughly agree, readily agree, wholeheartedly agree and enthusiastically agree that the best person to do Pran Pradeshta in Ram Temple is Sri Narendra Damodar Das Modi, the Honorable Prime Minister of India and he did an outstanding job of it and criticizing that is therefore blasphemous, it's an act of sacrilege and Rahul Gandhi is guilty of it by ex but I accelerate him because it is done in ignorance, ignorance of what religion is, how it functions, what its attractions and hypnotic powers are and therefore I can only conclude this video by requesting him to refrain from making statements about how religions are practices. He is perfectly qualified to make statements about what, relig what spirituality is and how it, sh it should influence, say, the political culture of a country, the social uh, dynamics of a people, uh, so on and so forth, even world order for that matter. But when it comes to anything religious, it's highly risky because religion is a very different cup of tea. It has to be understood as something completely different, even uh, flagrantly contradictory to the spiritual core of that particular tradition. Christianity as a religion is a blatant contradiction of the spiritual light at the core of it, which is Jesus Christ and his teachings. And that's the reason why Jesus is an outsider, or I would rather say an outcast, O-U-T-C-A-S-T-E, outcast. I deliberately use that word. Jesus Christ is an outcast to churches of every denomination or every abomination. And this truth is now, for fortunately, dawning with increasing clarity on Christians. And I consider that to be a very healthy development. So, I hail the inauguration of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya as a significant religious cultural event. And I wish all its organizers the very best. May a hundred Ram Temples more be built everywhere. 
I, I suggest that there should be a quota. Every state must be given a quota according to the population. Uh, Kerala must get at least one Ram temple comparable to Ram temple in Ayodhya. Why should the presence of Ram be confined to Ayodhya or UP alone? Every state, every union territory, depending on its geographical ter size and the population, uh, must be sanctioned a Ram temple and its Pran Pratishta must be a matter of cultural competition. And finally, after all states have completed their Pran Pratishta competition, the best award, say some 10,000 crores, should be awarded. And that's how we can promote our culture. It's a cultural event. As a cultural event, uh, I have absolutely no problem with it. Uh, in fact, there must be a cultural renaissance and there's one way of promoting it. But if you see it as a spiritual event, then you may have to agree with Rahul Gandhi. But Rahul Gandhi is wrong, wrong, wrong in assuming that it's a spiritual event. It's a religious event of great splendor, great magnitude, undertaken on an unprecedented scale. And therefore, three cheers to the Pran Pratishta in Ayodhya Ram Temple. Jai Hind, one day. Madam.